on the turn of the 70s, from the 60s to the 70s, squatting began to be um, more of a social force. More and more people were squatting there, more and more empty houses. And out of the squatting movement came a lot of free activity. If you don't have to pay rent to use a place, then you don't necessarily have to charge people to come into it. There's one way to look at it. Uh, I'm thinking of a particular squatted cinema in Notting Hill. Um, but there are other, there's other benefits to not having to pay rent. And one of them is that you get more uh, leisure time because you don't have to earn the money to pay the rent. And this naturally gave rise actually to the free festival movement. In the, in this is, now I'm talking about the first half of the 70s where there's the Windsor Free Festival and Watchfield, Fun City and other ones. Of course, they, they were preceded by the free concerts in the park, of which the Stones in the Park was, is the best known one. That was in 1969. Um, by about the uh, mid-70s, I think Glastonbury had started to happen. And Glastonbury now is like a rite of passage for lots of young people. Uh, if you step backwards and look and ask what in the early 60s was the similar rite of passage, you'd have to look at the Aldermaston March, which is a three-day march, that the way they went from the, the bomb factories in Aldermaston to Trafalgar Square, arriving on Easter Monday. And that was... Uh, it, it was... It was regarded as a protest movement, but it was also something a bit deeper than that. And you can see the... Uh, the continuity between those marches and uh, Paris in 1968 and the free concerts in the park in 1969 and then the, the festival movement, some of which was free. I mean, the Isle of Wight, a lot of the Isle of Wight 19, 1970 was free because people broke down the barriers. But then the free festival movement went on and there were several at Stonehenge and, as I say, finally Glastonbury uh, consolidated itself. I mean, I know it's not free now, but uh, there's al also a, a side current of free festivals which keeps happening. There's one called Cooper Sky Dance, which is uh, a shot from ground level looking up towards really quite a large empty building. It, it must be a residential building about maybe five or six stories high. And most of the windows are smashed out. And standing right on top of the building with his, with his arms raised in, in the air is Mike Cooper, who at that time was an architect um, with a particular interest in the reuse of buildings, including squatted buildings. And if you like, that's a, that's a sort of symbolic or metaphoric picture uh, where the free citizen is standing on the wreckage of previous civilization with his, with his hands in the air and, and saying, look, we won after all. Bertrand Russell, uh, one of the best known English philosophers of the 20th century, a well-respected academic, was in the late 1950s the, the chairman of CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Um, in the 50s, you, know, you may recall, there were a lot of airborne nuclear testing, tests, mainly over the Pacific. But for those of us who were born previous to that, we still carry the radioactive signature of those tests. I know because I've been to Sellafield and I've had my profile measured. Um, it's understandable that uh, people were, were deeply worried by uh, the fact that our government spent so much money on nuclear armaments. Uh, for who were they going to fire them at and what was going to happen when people fired back? The whole thing was mutual assisted destruction. It was mad. Anyway, the campaign for nuclear disarmament was uh, a mass movement of, of uh, peaceful people 
who, who were protesting against nuclear weapons. Um, Bertrand Russell was the first chairman of, of CND, as it was called. But uh, after a year or two, he realized that peaceful marches without any action didn't really produce a result. It was all very well going on marches, but um, when you'd finished going on the march, it was difficult to identify if there'd been any change in anything, and in fact, usually there wasn't. So he decided to break away and form a group of leading intellectuals and academics and well-respected people, uh, an organisa organisation called the Committee of 100, whose first public act was to stage a, a sit-down in front of the Ministry of Defence in Parliament Square. Um, and Russell led it by being the first person to sit down and he was carried away by the police. And this brought in an incredible amount of public opinion to bear because it was really scandalous that such an eminent person could have been arrested simply for protesting. The Committee of 100, there was a breakaway movement from that called Spies for Peace, who were very secretive. And they, among other things, uncovered a, a countrywide network of bunkers intended to be used by the government after a nuclear war. The government was very annoyed that uh, these plans were disclosed. And um, that was about the most significant thing that Spies for Peace did. Um, what's interesting is if you look at these three uh, groupings, the CND, which was a mass movement, the Committee of 100, which was more activist, and the Spies for Peace, they really depended on each other in order to do what they were doing. CND by itself wasn't sufficient. The Spies for Peace by itself wouldn't have been sufficient because you can't expect people... You can't expect a mass movement to join you doing illegal activity. But together, the spectrum of groups um, was more effective than, than any one group by itself. If we now look at CND for a moment, it gained in strength from year to year. Every year, there was a march from Aldermaston, which is a, a, a place near Reading where atomic weapons are made, to London, uh, and the march would always happen at Easter, ending in, in Trafalgar Square on Easter Monday. Um, in 1964, just before the general election, um, Harold Wilson spoke at, at, the, at the CND rally and declared himself to be uni, unilateral, in favour of unilateral disarmament. In other words, he was anti-nuclear. As soon as he won the election and got into power, he reversed 180 degrees and became pro-nuclear. Um, that betrayal marked the beginning of the demise of CND as a mass movement. And for those of us who were involved, I mean, I was involved in organising the photo coverage of the 64 March for CND, for whom I also worked. The behaviour of Wilson was such a strong political message to the rest of us that our politics have never quite recovered from the body blow that they were given by, the, by that betrayal. And I think that if you look at what happens today, it sits rather uneasily by the side of what was going on then.